tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. If you're in the flavored air category is quickly becoming the lead alternative to vaping and smoking, Talk about a change for the better. And it just so happens the leader in this category is our good friends at Fume. Fume is an award-winning flavored air device designed to take the place of that lousy habit of yours. No vapor, no electronics, no chemicals, just natural delicious flavors. Fume has served over 300,000 customers and you could be the next success story. For a limited time, use my code CHILLING to get a free gift with your journey pack. Head to tryfume.com. That's tryfum.com and use code CHILLING to get a free gift with your order today. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Acorns. The idea of investing your money can feel intimidating. I get it. Most of us know it's the right move for our futures, but who has the time to research all that stuff? And frankly, who's got that much money to begin with? The good news is Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for your future. You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Head to acorns.com slash chilling or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement or client testimonial. Compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. View important disclosures at acorns.com slash chilling. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about workplace warnings and insipid injustices. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Erutius and Sarah Jane Huntington are voice talents Rissa Montanez, Olivia Steele, Kevin Barberi, and myself, Steve Taylor. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Erutius and performed by Kevin Barberi, myself, Steve Taylor, and Rissa Montanez. 
I've heard it said that there's no such thing as a truly selfless deed. When we do something kind for others, there's likely something that we get out of it as well, such as a feeling of achievement or fulfillment of a good deed. Well, that's certainly not the case here. Now, without further ado, I present to you... I discovered why my barber cuts my hair for free. Mr. Faskell has cut my hair since I moved to the city about three years ago. He's an older guy, maybe 50s or 60s, and he possesses that look and draw that makes me think he's from up north somewhere. He could be from New York, Maine, or even the Great Lakes area, but I never asked him where. He's not a big guy maybe a buck twenty in the rain, and he cuts my hair just the way I like it, high and tight on the sides, leaves them on top so whoever I'm sleeping with has something to play with and neaten up my sideburns. I can't grow a real beard or he'd probably trim that for me too. The best part is that he does it all for free. Hard to believe, I know, but it seems there was a cost after all. Our relationship started easily enough, I had an interview with the city, maintenance and custodial, and I wanted to look sharp and make a good impression. Everything other than that paid nothing or barely nothing, and I really wanted to lock this job down. I had a nice set of interview clothes, some comfortable business shoes, and a winning smile, and I needed a sharp haircut to seal the deal. That is where the problem lies. My hair grows abnormally fast. It always has. And when I was a kid, my dad used to bemoan the fact he made jokes about going to barber school or buying stock at master cuts, but he always understood that when it was time for a cut, it was time for a cut. If you let it go longer than two weeks without a cut, it just turns into a shapeless mass. By the end of week three, I looked like a sheepdog, and Dad would look over his paper and sigh before saying he would take me to the barber. Fasco's hair and beards was about a block from my house, and when I stuck my head in to see their prices, Mr. Fasco looked up and smiled at me over the pile of hair he was sweeping up. Then, suddenly, he took a deep breath, and when he opened his eyes again, I asked if everything was okay. Just fine, young man. Say, you look like a man in need of a haircut. Am I right? I told him he sure was, and he invited me in and told me to have a seat. He had about a million questions on that first visit. No, I didn't usually let it get this long. I liked it this way, but a little long on top. No, I didn't use any special shampoo, just dandruff shampoo from the Dollar General. No, I wasn't really prone to dry scalp, but a fella can never be too careful. On and on and on and on, until finally it was done. He had cut it just right. The perfect length, the perfect fade, everything. I asked him what I owed him, and he told me it was free. Come on, I said. You gotta charge me something. I let my customers pay what they can afford, so whatever you can afford is fine with me. Think of it as a tip. I was okay with that and walked out with a free haircut while Mr. Faskell waved me out with a $10 tip. I left with a spring in my step. I felt like a new man, and I was ready for that job interview. I went home, got a shower, and when I looked in the mirror, I knew I had this. The next time I went to see Mr. Faskell, I left him a $20 tip and told him it was all thanks to him that I had gotten my awesome new job. For the next couple of years, I always went to Mr. Faskell when I needed a cut. If I had a date coming up, I went to Faskell's. Promotion interview at work? Faskell's. I told friends about his shop. I went there just to get a touch-up and talk with the old fella. In no time at all, Mr. Faskell and I were friends. He liked the same sports team I did, watched a lot of the same movies and TV shows I did, and even liked a lot of the same classic rock that I did. It was great, and I always looked forward to my bi-monthly haircut. Then, about two months ago, it all changed. I had come in to get my bi-monthly cut, telling Mr. Faskell about the previous week as he cut and styled my hair. He was always meticulous, getting everything just right as he cut and trimmed. And when he turned me around to look in the mirror, it was the same way I had gotten it for the last three years. I thanked him, handed him ten bucks, and told him I'd see him soon. Of course, Mr. Faskell said, sweeping up the hair. Come back any time. 
I was leaving, almost a block up the street, when I realized I didn't have my sunglasses. They were my brand new Oakleys and they had cost quite a bit of cash. I remembered having them when I came up, taking them off my head and setting them down at the station Mr. Faskell used. No problem, I thought. I'll just go back and get them. I stepped in, saying I had forgotten my sunglasses and was just going to grab them, and that's when I saw him. Mr. Faskell was looking up guiltily, his eyes panicked. He was down on all fours, eating the hair he had swept up off the ground like he was a cow in the field. When he turned, I could see pieces of hair sticking to his lip like accusations. He stood up, whipping himself off, brushing at his mouth as he tried to explain. I know how this looks, and I'll admit that, yes, I was eating your hair. But you have to understand, your hair is what I look forward to. I don't eat just anyone's hair. Well, I used to. Now I can't wait to see you come in so I can eat something good. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy, he shouted, getting up as he stalked toward me. He seemed to realize that saying that made him sound crazy, so he switched gears. Haven't I always done good work for you? There's nowhere in this town that you would get a haircut for less than $25. I cut your hair for tips. I've cut your hair for the dollars in your pocket. I've been good to you, and you've been a good customer. Let's just pretend this never happened, okay? Let's just go back to... But I didn't hear the rest. I snatched up my sunglasses and was out the door before he could say another word. I spent a while thinking about that, and the more I processed it, the worse it seemed to get. It began to haunt my dreams, seeing him bent over it, eating the hair straight off the floor, looking back at me and grinning with my hair in his teeth, and I would wake up in a cold sweat. I know, it's not a particularly scary thing, but it freaked the hell out of me. I don't really like it when people put hair in their mouths. I had a girl in elementary school who used to chew her pigtails and it bred a lifetime phobia in me. Just the thought of wet hair in someone's mouth makes me want to puke, and I can't even touch someone's hair without cringing if they have a wig. A weird collection of phobias, but they're mine. It only took a couple of weeks before I started seeing new growth. My hair just grows too fast, and after three weeks, my boss commented that I was looking shabby. He handed me a 20 out of his own wallet and told me to get a trim over lunch. I took it and started looking for somewhere to get a trim. The city had quite a few shops, but it seemed like whenever I was in one, I caught someone looking at me out of the corner of my eye. It was never anything I could prove, just a feeling. And when I looked up, I could almost catch a glimpse of Mr. Faskell. He was gone when I looked but it made me extremely paranoid. I became aware of more than a glimpse as the weeks went on. When I rode the bus to work, I caught the familiar deep inhale of someone smelling my hair. When I was standing in a lunch line, I felt my hair move as someone inhaled. When I was at Walmart buying groceries, someone actually touched my hair, but they were gone when I turned around. It led me to become something of a recluse, and I only left the house to go to work. Over time... My hair grew out, and I decided I would have to get another cut. I went to bed, setting my alarm so I could get up early enough to go to the master cuts down on Bonnie. It was Saturday. I had the day off, and I had chores to do before I got to the business of relaxing. As I slipped off to sleep, I fell into a familiar dream, a dream that had plagued me for weeks. I was sitting in the barber chair at Mr. Faskell's, the cape falling around me like a spider web and the old man asking me if it was too tight. I didn't say anything. I was too scared to speak. And as the scissors began to clip, I trembled in fear. I didn't dare look back at the old man. I just knew his real face would be replaced by a monstrous visage, and I would wake up panting and looking around for nothing at all. When the alarm went off, I went to the bathroom to splash some water on my face and start the shower. My bare shoulder itched, and when I went to wipe it off, I noticed there was hair clinging to my sweaty hand. Not a lot, just leavings. Like the leavings you find after a haircut. I ran to the bathroom and found that my hair was cut just the way I liked it. The sides were high and tight, the top was manageable but still thick, and my bangs were perfect. Everything was just as it usually was. 
I felt a cold chill run through me that had nothing to do with air conditioning. I called the landlord, had the locks changed, and reported to the police that someone had broken into my house and cut my hair. The police didn't really take it seriously. They made jokes about a midnight barber and asked if I'd left a tip under my pillow. I told them about Mr. Faskell, but when I gave them the address, they just shook their heads and walked away. They thought I was joking with them. They didn't believe a word of what I told them, and as I ran the shower, I remember sitting under the water for a very long time and just letting it run over me. The bits of hair flowing down the drain felt like a betrayal. Two weeks later, I woke up with another fresh haircut. I called the police, but they rolled their eyes and told me to calm down. I told them it was hard for me to calm down when someone was breaking into my house and cutting my hair. I demanded they go check on Mr. Faskell and told them right where his shop was. But they looked less amused this time at the suggestion. I asked if they had been to talk to him yet and told them he had been there for three years. But they just told me it hadn't been funny the first time and it wasn't funny now. Why would it be funny, I asked having to stop myself from grabbing one of them. Because Faskell's has never been open. It was a prop for the city's revitalization project. Like coolie flowers across the street from it or green butcher beside it. It's set dressing. It's never open. Mr. Faskell was a guy who owned a barber shop in the 20s. He's dead. There is no Faskell who cuts hair. They left, and that left me very rattled. Mr. Faskell isn't a ghost, I know that. I have friends who go to him. I have felt him touch me. He's flesh and blood just like I am, I'm sure of it. The fact that he eats hair is incidental. The man is real. But if he isn't Mr. Faskell, then who is he? How does he keep breaking into my house? I have a window in my room, but it's barred with a piece of broom handle, and I live on the third floor. I changed the locks again. I wedged a chair under my door, and when I finally made myself calm down enough to sleep, I hoped it would end. I woke up completely bald. Not buzzed, not at a zero guard, but bald. Like someone shaved my head in my sleep and took the hair. They got my eyebrows, too. My five o'clock shadow and my thick sideburns. I was smooth and hairless as a newborn baby. I don't know what to do. I can't call the cops. They won't believe me. I can't call the landlord. He's replaced the locks twice now and is getting angry about it. I can't afford to move. I can't leave my job. I'm stuck. What I did find, however, was a message left on my nightstand. I'm sure the cops will say that I wrote it, but I know I didn't. There's hair on it, and it's written in a heavy hand like a kid's scribblings. It's done on the back of an ad for Faskell's hair and beards, and the implication was pretty obvious. Come see me when it grows back. If you don't, it makes no difference. I know where to find you. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. The bad habit business knows what makes you tick, folks. They've got you hooked on that oral fixation, and they've set your health and wallet to drain. It's no wonder the flavored air category is becoming the number one alternative to this nonsense. And leading the way are our good friends at Fume. Fume is an award-winning flavored air device that uses no harmful chemicals, no batteries, and no nicotine. Just delicious flavors and a good habit you can indulge without guilt. It's a whole new movement towards better habits and backed by doctors in the U.S. I love using my Fume. You can't tell it's made to keep your hands busy. It has a good weight to it. There's plenty of parts to fidget with, good for keeping uh, stress at bay. I recommend you start with the crisp mint and orange vanilla flavor cores. Really tasty. And you know what else is tasty? Not ruining your health with toxic chemicals. My compliments to the chef. 
Fume has served over 300,000 customers, and you could be the next success story. For a limited time, use my code CHILLING to get a free gift with your journey pack. Head to tryfume.com. That's tryfum.com. And use code CHILLING to get a free gift with your order today. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Acorns. Hey, you know, that shoebox full of money you keep on the top shelf in your closet? How much you got in there anyway? A couple grand? Nice. You know how much that's going to be worth in a year or two? Yeah, still a couple of grand. Meanwhile, groceries are going to be up another 20%. So why not invest that money and give it a chance to grow with acorns? I understand. Investing can feel intimidating and you don't even know where to start. Who has time to research that stuff, right? That's why most of us put it off for so long. The good news is Acorns makes it easy to start saving and investing for your future. You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals then automatically invest your money for you. Easy as pie. Listen, we all wonder what were we thinking when this or that IPO came out? Like, why didn't I get in on Amazon early? It's because Acorns wasn't here to help me out. That's why. Still, my investments have done well, and I suggest you consider taking stock of your future too. Head to acorns.com slash chilling or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement or client testimonial. Compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. View important disclosures at acorns.com slash chilling. I hope you enjoyed I Discovered Why My Barber Cuts My Hair for Free as written by Arutius and performed by Kevin Barberi, myself Steve Taylor, and Rissa Montanez. This tale comes to us by a trusted old friend, the No Sleep subreddit. Arutius's work, along with many others, can be found right here on this forum. Our second tale of the evening is written by Sarah Jane Huntington and performed by Olivia Steele and Kevin Barberi. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Judgment. They tell me I will go to hell. Some even tell me I deserve a place in the fiery pits of eternal damnation. They say I should burn for my crime, that I should suffer even more. They tell me death is my most just and worthy punishment. Some say my sin is beyond evil itself. If I could have explained, if they had only let me talk, instead of confusing me with long, complicated words and rules set in stone by them, trial by fire... Guilty before my judgment even began. Seen and found lacking. Branded a vile woman. My crime wasn't a sin. It was justice. It was pure survival. And now I face the ultimate punishment. A fate chosen by men. A guard comes. He asks me which foods I would like to eat as if a meal might fill the emptiness crawling around inside my stomach. I ignore him. Words feel too painful to form, too numb. Another comes. He asks if I want to see a priest, as if a man of God might absolve me of my fear, of my terror, the kind of brutal horror I lived with for years. I don't deserve to die. I know that. 
I deserve to live and thrive, don't I? My husband, the one who promised to love me always, him, he wore a mask during our short courtship, played his illusions and clever trickster ways. I didn't see through his act, couldn't. Love blinded me, and truly I adored him. People called him a good man. They said I was lucky. Our wedding in 52 was perfect. Joy filled me so much it hurt to breathe. My face hurt from my permanent smile. I was happy. We were happy. Until it changed. He changed. His carefully constructed mask of deceit cracked apart like an old porcelain doll. At first, small things. Angry words directed at me, followed by an apology, and sometimes flowers too. Pretty scented roses, blood red. No marriage is perfect, I told myself, persuaded myself. He worked hard. I was forbidden from taking a job. I was meant to be a housewife, a rule laid down by him. Every day I would prowl our house, clean and cook, wash and fold. Nothing I did was ever right. The folds were wrong, the creases unacceptable. Food was overcooked, undercooked, tasteless or sour. You're a bad wife! He shouted. Useless! In my sadness, I vowed to try harder. I smiled more. I entertained friends of his by pouring drinks and serving food. A perfect hostess. I was dutiful, faithful, devoted. I wore the dresses he chose, painted on the makeup he liked, wore my hair just the way he wanted it. My wedding ring became a shackle. Still, he was never pleased. One sudden slap became two. A vile punch became a weekly event. Threats, manipulation, abuse. I couldn't see. I blamed myself. After all, I was useless, like he said. I became pregnant. A child was born. A girl. He wasn't pleased. Females had no value to him. Only good for one thing. Our daughter cried, teething. I couldn't silence her. She refused to be calmed. A single blow, powered by frustration from his vicious fist, knocked me off my feet. I fell down onto the perfect tiles I scrubbed every day for hours. I knew then that one day he would kill me. I knew. I'm sorry, he said. I'll change. No emergency room visit. It was forbidden. Isolated inside our dollhouse of a home, I paced. I wanted to leave, to take my daughter and run. But to where? I had nowhere to go. No family, no friends, no job, no money, no hope. Outside the front door, only shame and poverty waited to greet me. No life for my golden girl, my daughter, my reason. No change in him occurred. He stayed angry, primal with rage over my careless mistakes. One wrong word, a spill, a failure to do as he asked, provoked him. He yanked my hair, threw me to the ground, kicked, a brutal kick. Ribs snapped under his polished shoe. I'm sorry, he said. This time I will change. No change. Wounds took longer to heal. No rest. Hidden inside and imprisoned. Pregnant again. Forced every night. Another daughter arrived. Fury sparked inside him. It's your fault, he raged. I wanted a son. I wish I'd never married you. His wish was also mine. Scarred and bruised and ashamed, time passed. Life drained out of me. The fight was already lost. Nowhere to go. No one to help. An empty shell acting as a mother, as a useless wife. I paced again, a prisoner. Time ticked away slowly. 
I dreaded his arrival home from work. Still, I smiled. I acted. My turn to wear a mask. Anything to avoid his wrath. On a hot summer evening, on our eldest daughter's third birthday, she spilled her milk as I cut her pretty cake. A simple accident. No harm done. None at all. Enraged by this mess, he struck her. Hard. <clears throat> a fire ignited, one inside me. My hands shook. My mind shattered. Static filled my thoughts. A primal spark exploded. Rage of the kind I'd never felt before engulfed me. I snapped. Knife in my hand, I stabbed. Again and again, one blow for each of mine. So many. Warm blood and gore, the color of roses. Still, I stabbed, lost in a fury. Then came screams, my own loud howls of horror. A sharp knock at the door from a worried neighbor. Then sirens sounded, gruff voices, the splintering of wood. Rough hands grabbed me, pulled me away, away from my beautiful girls, away from the lifeless body of my husband. They put me in chains, a different kind to the ones that bound my marriage. They called me a monster. They said my sin was beyond evil. They told me I will go to hell. It's almost time, and the fear inside me ripples. What will become of me? Where will I go? Those men that decided my fate, are they not murderers too? I don't understand. I don't. I killed my enemy like soldiers in a war. I was in a war too, a relentless battle. No bullets, no explosions, but a war all the same. I did not plot or plan. I did not poison or scheme. Tears fall from my eyes. I am afraid of dying, of what comes after. Will it hurt? I have endured so much. I sought freedom. Freedom for myself and my girls. Instead, they served me death. Victim or villain, they asked, while they had already decided I was the villain. No justice. No compassion. I killed a man before he killed me. I snapped first. A mother's primal instinct. If I could only see my daughters one last time. If I could only tell them I did it for them. I wasn't brave enough to do it just for me. What choice did I have? I hear footsteps. Keys jangling. Please, God, no, I say. My voice wobbles and shakes with fear. My heart is racing. Two guards, solemn faces. They have come for me. I fall, scamper into a corner. I am so frightened. I know fear. I know pain. This... This is something entirely different. It's time. One tells me. An act of mercy. His eyes shine with tears. Please, I beg. Please don't. They glance at each other and step forward. I am cornered. And I know it. Trapped by men whose job it is to preach justice. A system in place... One designed back to front and upside down, made by men as guilty as my own dead husband. Keys click. My cell doors open. A resounding metal scrape pierces my brain. They grab my arms. My legs won't work. They pull me roughly as if I am a rag doll. Forgive me, I whisper. Please, just forgive me. I only sought life. I wanted to live without fear, without pain. I wanted to protect. I only wanted to be free. And now I die. Down the bleak corridor, dragged to my damnation, forced into my ending, into the cold, ruthless chair of wood and steel, 
strapped down by pitiless hands. Please, I beg. No, stop. The same words I said to my husband over and over. My fragile mind quakes. I feel the bindings in my brain fly apart. My mouth, rough fingers probe and press. I can't focus. Voices speak and I can't hear. My hair is pulled, a cap wedged on. I need to tell them I'm sorry. Sorry for saving myself and my girls. Faces watch, doll faces with cold glass eyes. No emotion, no regret, no mercy. A countdown, a switch, a jolt of brutal terror with full power to kill. And to think, I wanted to escape being murdered, only to be murdered by colder hands and hearts instead. I hope you enjoyed Judgment, as written by Sarah Jane Huntington and performed by Olivia Steele and Kevin Barberi. Our final tale this evening is being brought to us by our friends over at VLOX. Find this story and hundreds more over at www.veloxbooks.com. Well, on to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Chirey has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook X and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, chillingtalesfordarknights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.